So let me begin with a uh, quick review of what we did last time. The major uh, issues were figuring out how infinitesimal or differential material line, surface, and volume elements were mapped to one another. Um, so if we take a, it turns out, a material line element on the reference configuration, and we'd like to find out how it's mapped to the current configuration, what governs that map is a tensor F that is defined as partial small x over partial capital X, which is the deformation gradient tensor. In terms of components, it reads F I A E I bond E A. So it's a two-point tensor, and I mentioned how one has to keep track of how these two-point tensors, or in general, it might be a one-point tensor as well, but it might have only E or capital E as a basis. We have to be careful about how these tensors operate on other tensors and vectors, just to make sure that the correct vectors come into operations with one another. So that doesn't necessarily ensure that what we're doing is correct, but at least we know that it will make sense. We're not making a drastic mistake, right? Um, so that's the deformation gradient tensor and governs how line elements are mapped to one another. And that's the basis for figuring out, remember, how the remaining ones are mapped to one another. For instance, if you take a um, differential area element and you'd like to figure out how um, the area element is mapped from one configuration to another. So this is the magnitude times the outward unit normal of the area. What governs that map is the cofactor tensor. And the cofactor tensor, using the notation that eventually we have introduced last time, is nothing but the determinant of F, which we call J, the Jacobian F minus transpose. And if we want to figure out how or if we'd like to know how the volume elements are mapped to another, that is through J, which is determinant of um, F. Okay? So that is the basis for the uh, maps between material line, surface, and um, volume <coughs> elements. Now, last time what I mentioned was another additional issue that we're going to concentrate on today. When we wrote dx and d capital X, we wrote it in the form a differential length. S was the arc length parametrization on the current configuration. On the reference, it was capital S. So that's the differential length. And then it had a unit direction, small or lowercase or capital uh, M. Okay? So now, the direction obviously could change. So the unit vector directions of, so directions of capital M and small m, they don't need to match, nor do the capital S and the small s. So the lines of these elements. So when F maps, it's going to take a line element, and it's going to rotate in general and also change its length. So the rotation is one thing, but the change in the length, you can imagine, has to do with the mechanical concept of strain. And that's what we would like to analyze in more detail on um, this lecture. Okay, so let me move on to a clean board here and let's talk a little bit more in detail about um, what is a stretch and how it helps us define um, strain. So I'll start with the line element map. And as I said, well, this is DSM, this is D capital S capital M. <laughs> And what I can do is I can simply define the ratio of these differential lengths. And both of them are positive. And so lambda is something that is for sure greater than 0. And lambda is what is called a stretch. Okay. And obviously, if this is greater than 1, you have elongation. That infinitesimal line element is increasing its length. And if it is less than 1, then it is contraction. It's decreasing its length. Now, lambda is not something we are, um, we are not accustomed to. It is intimately related to a concept that we know from undergraduate mechanics. In our undergraduate mechanics, uh, we actually 
introduced that concept, concept because we talk about uh, nonlinear elasticity in a simple one-dimensional setting. But why don't you have a look here for a second? We, you will recall the simple diagram when one introduces the concept of strain um, in 1D. So suppose you have a bar. This bar is of length L. Um, and I apply a force such that it extends, let's say, uniformly by an amount delta L. And uh, we know that the so-called engineering strain is nothing but the change in length divided by the original length. So this is the engineering strain in 1D. Okay. So on the other hand, now if we'd like to sort of rephrase this problem slightly in the notation that we already have, I can introduce an arc length on the undeformed configuration. So this solid rectangle will be the reference configuration R0. And the arc length would go from 0 to the length of the domain. It's 1D already, so L. And on the deformed configuration, the arc length right, would go from 0 to the new length, which would be L plus delta L. Okay, so then, if you'd like to talk about the stretch, and here I'm assuming that the strain is uniform, I'm going to take the ratio of a some change in the arc length on the current configuration over some a change in the arc length or distance on the reference configuration. So suppose I, talk, I take those lengths to be the whole length. So in other words, I'm going to take lambda s, a certain amount of change in s over capital S, and this length I'm going to take to be the whole length, L plus delta L, divided by the original length L, right? which means that originally it was length L, and that material line element, which is of this length, is going to be mapped to this new length, right? And which is clearly 1 plus epsilon. So what we call stretch, even in this one-dimensional setting, it's not something that we have not seen before. Indeed, it's related to the concept of engineering strain. Okay? So please. Uh, just, if you like, complete your notes, and we will then continue. Okay, so now what I will do is I will have this concept of stretch appearing in the derivations or the expressions that I will um, write on the board. And I will start with the fundamental expression, right? So what I'm doing is if you look at the top left expression, right? So it's dx is f dx. I'm dividing both sides by d capital S. So on the left-hand side, I have the stretch remaining. And on the right-hand side, I have only the unit vector and the tensor itself, OK? So now, let me begin with this um, expression. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to write a bunch of th things on this board. And that will be one view of the concepts that we are trying to cover. And then I hope to fit everything on this one board. And then I'm going to pull up the other board. And then I'm going to write the same sort of concepts, express the same concept from a different perspective. And then we'll have a chance to compare uh, the two views. I'm going to follow the identical set of steps. Okay. Um, so the first thing I will do is I will take a dot of both sides with itself. Okay. So because they are equal, right? lambda m dot lambda m, so that's going to be lambda um, squared. 
And let me not skip any steps at this point. So I have fm dot fm. Now, of course, what I can do is I can take f to this side as a transpose. So I have f transpose fm. And this tensor f transpose f is what we will denote with c. And c, therefore, f transpose f is a new expression. And it's an important expression. It's called the right Cauchy-Green deformation tensor. And since I've said it's the right one, you can imagine there's going to be also the left one. And that will pop up shortly. Okay. Um, let's look at what C looks like in terms of components. So C is F transpose F. And now I have to be careful, right? Remember from last time when I express F transpose. So it's F I A. And then you switch the basis when you take the transpose. And then F usual, F, let's say, J, B, E, J, bond, E, B. And then you carry on with the expression. Now, these two vectors are going to be dotted. These are going to be bond. And I see that correct vectors will be appearing within the dot operation. So I'm sure that I'm doing things at least meaningfully. So that's going to be delta I, J. And I can move one of those delta, one of those I's or J's either here or there. And I will end up with F, I, A, F, J, B, E, A, bond, E, B. Okay. So that must be the component C, A, B of the right Cauchy-Green deformation tensor. Okay. So note that it is something that naturally lives in the reference configuration, and rightly so, because what it does is it operates or it appears in an operation where two referential vectors appear, right? So both of its bases, because both of these vectors are referential vectors, both of the basis vectors that appear in the tensorial basis, they have to be referential vectors uh, for, these, for this expression to make sense, OK? Um, all right. Now, Is there a question? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Thanks. OK, so now, now F is a immutable tensor. Right. Why? Because I assumed that for F to correspond to physical uh, deformations, the determinant Jacobian has to be greater than 0. Um, and therefore, it admits a polar decomposition. And here, I'm going to make use of the right polar decomposition. Right? Um, and so we remember that here, R is proper. It has to be proper because F has a positive determinant. And U is symmetric, positive, definite. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to calculate C. C is F transpose F. And so I can take the transpose of F. So it's going to be U transpose R transpose. Okay? But U is symmetric. So it comes in as U R transpose. Right? So if you like, there was a U transpose, but it's symmetric. So I've gotten rid of that. And then F itself, R U. And then R transpose R is identity because R is proper, is orthogonal. And therefore, the result is U squared. And that is nothing but C, because it's F transpose uh, F. So why is this called the right Cauchy-Green deformation tensor? Because what appears here is the symmetric posted this definite tensor that has to do with the right polar um, decomposition. Now, not only that, now we have a little bit more information. Now, when you look at the definition of C, it is symmetric from the outset, right? F trans take its transpose, it's still F transpose F, OK? But is it positive definite, for instance? That information, it's not so apparent here. But now, when you look here, 
We know u is symmetric positive definite. And when you take the square of such a tensor, the outcome is still positive definite. And now I have additional information about C. It is symmetric, goes without saying through the definition, but it is also positive definite. Okay. And that's a nice result. In fact, that's not only a nice result, it is also a result that I better have because I may wish to calculate lambda. Lambda is equal to the square root of that expression. Right? Lambda square is mcm, or lambda is m, right? It's always greater than 0, m dot cm. Now, what does this expression tell us? What are we calculating? At a point in your configuration, you have the tensor C. You can calculate it at a point. Then you choose a direction on the reference configuration. It's a unit vector m. And this result tells you how much the material line element along the direction that you have chosen at the point where you calculate C stretches. It's by lambda. Right? You can choose the direction arbitrarily. And for any choice of m, the result better be meaningful. In other words, this thing better be always greater than 0. And because c is positive definite, you might remember the alternative definition of symmetric positive definite. m is non-zero. It's a unit vector. So for all m, if this is greater than 0, then it is positive definite. Right? And by the fact that since I know it's positive definite, it follows that it is greater than 0 um, for every m. So it's, it's something that, that I better have. Okay? And finally, and let me write this in a slightly different color, um, I can work on an eigenvalue problem for either u or c. Because it's a symmetric tensor, then eventually it will have a nice expression in terms of its spectral decomposition. So let me work with u. So let me write down the eigenvalue problem for u. Well, how do you calculate u? Right? <laughs> you can calculate c. It's f transpose. So given f, you can calculate c. And u is nothing but the square root of c. Okay? So that's, in principle, how you would calculate it. Um, so u then has eigenvalues and eigenvectors. Since u is a tensor which I know should live in the reference configuration, why? Because c lives in the reference configuration, then it will have vectors, let me denote, with, denote them with capital B, that also live in the reference configuration. Uh, these are eigenvectors and corresponding eigenvalues. Lambda alpha. And these lambda alpha are called principal stretches. And once you solve for that eigenvalue problem, then you can go ahead and express either u or c as, so first of all, u through the spectral decomposition, right? I have to put a sum over alpha because it's an index that will appear three times. Lambda alpha, capital V alpha times capital V alpha. That's his eigenvector basis. Or C is U squared, and therefore, in its eigenvalue representation, it admits a very simple expression. It's simply going to be lambda square alpha, V alpha, upon V alpha. Of course, in practice, you may want to do things a little bit different because calculating C is easy, F transpose F. You can actually go ahead and calculate the eigenvalues and vectors of C. And then if you want to know the eigenvalue of U, that's just the square root of the eigenvalue of C. Maybe that's a 
nicer way to find out the expression for um, u. Uh, in any case, I can express what u and c are in terms of its their corresponding spectral decompositions. Any questions so far? Any question? OK. So now what I will do is I will repeat almost the same set of calculations, but with a twist. Okay. So, so far, all the objects that appear, except for f, have to do with the reference configuration. Now, when I twist the picture, I will have objects that appear only on the spatial or current configuration. But still, I will be implicitly analyzing the stretch. Okay. Um, so let's do that. So similarly, and the way I will start those cal that calculation is, if you look here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take f to the left-hand side as an f inverse, and I'm going to take lambda to the right-hand right side as 1 over lambda. Okay. So lambda inverse capital M is f inverse small m. Okay. And I proceed in the same fashion. I dot both sides. So on the left-hand side, I will have lambda to the power minus 2. And on the right-hand side, f inverse m dot at f inverse m. I can move this f to the right of the dot. And that will be f minus transpose f inverse m. Okay. And that tensor that appears in here, I'm going to give it a special name. Let's call it small b. Okay. And in fact, let's call it b inverse, because I want b to mean something um, slightly different. So my definition here of b is f, f transpose. And it is called the left Cauchy-Green deformation tensor. Right? B inverse is F minus transpose F inverse. So that's the object that appears here. All right, so again, proceeding line by line in an identical fashion, I want to analyze B. I'd like to find out what its components look like. So it's F, F transpose. Let me do the same thing once again in terms of components. F, I, A, E, I, bond, capital E, A. And then F, J, B. E B bun E J and that will give me right dot the referential vectors delta A B move the or replace the B with an A due to the Kronecker delta uh, property and so I will have F I A F J A E I bun E J and this must be the component Bij of the um, left Cauchy Green deformation tensor. Okay. So now, um, again, I explicitly see that this is an object that lives exclusively on the current configuration, and rightly so, again, because its inverse right, appears in an operation where both vectors are spatial vectors. Okay, so let's proceed again in the same fashion. I'm going to into the brace. And now I'd like to express F again, in this case slightly differently through the left polar decomposition, F equals VR. And V is symmetric positive definite, R is the same rotation tensor that we've encountered before. Um, so now B is equal to F, F transpose, it's VR. And then the transpose of F is R transpose V transpose, but V is symmetric. R, R transpose is again identity. And so the result is V squared, which is 
by definition, B. Okay. And so what I found out here, just like I did for C, B is a tensor that is clearly symmetric from the outset. So that goes again without saying, but not only that, evidently it's also positive definite because V is a tensor that is positive definite. And it better be so again because lambda inverse, if I take the square root of both sides, lambda inverse is square root of M, B inverse M. And if B is positive definite, then its inverse is, and this quantity for any choice of unit vector is guaranteed to be positive. So this is greater than zero as required okay, for every M. Okay. Uh, so note that the interpretation of how you calculate, right? The, I said the picture is twisted, twisted in the following sense. Um, again, you go into it at a certain point, and at that point, you can calculate F and therefore B inverse. And at that point, along a given direction, which is identified by this unit vector, but now on the current configuration, you're interested in how much that vector, that line element, which happens to lie along this unit vector small m, was stretched. Okay? And this calculation tells you that it was stretched through lambda. But what you get is not lambda, but lambda inverse from the calculation. But the major information is still something that has to do with change of length at a point along a direction that you have chosen. Clearly, you choose different directions, the value of lambda will change. Again, there are special directions eigen, identified by the eigenvectors, which give you principal stretches. So let's also write down, as we did there, the eigenvalue problem for B, or in this case, V. So V in this case is the square root of B. Again, it's something we can easily calculate. And V will have some eigenvectors. Now, because B is a spatial tensor, right? V will also be a spatial tensor. And small v is a eigenvector that lives in the current configuration. So that's the eigenvalue problem. Um, Before I continue, just a short note. When I've written the eigenvalue problem, I picked a different notation for the eigenvectors. It has to be that way because the eigenvectors of u live in the reference of v in the current configuration. But when you look at the eigenvalues, I denoted them as lambda alpha. And here as well, I denoted them lambda as lambda alpha. So what I have to show in a minute is that the eigenvalues of V and U are indeed the same. Here, I'm supposing that they're the same, and I'm going to show that to you in a second. Okay. So, but if that's the expression, then of course what I can do is I can go ahead and express either V or B in terms of the eigenvector basis. So alpha equals one to three, alpha equals one to three, um, lambda alpha V alpha bond V alpha, or Lambda alpha squared, I'm sorry, um, right, V alpha bun V alpha. So I just noted, I assumed it's the same with that of you. I'm going to show it in a second. OK. Um, now, ju just a short note on the notation. Of course, you should, um, let's say, judge the 
context and try not to confuse notation. So a capital V has no index. I understand this to be a tensor, okay? Uh, and I have defined it before, right? It appears in the polar left polar decomposition of F. V in the notation that I have chosen with an index happens to belong to the, or indicate the eigenvectors of uh, U. So, but I think the context uh, makes it clear. We have only so many letters in the alphabet and we have to um, recycle them once in a while, all right? Uh, there will appear one more quantity like this. So soon, very soon, a capital E without an index, it will mean again a tensor, and it's a tensor that's very important for us. But again, I think the context makes it very clear what we're talking about. All right, so now you see I have followed pretty much the same picture uh, from different point of view, points of view. We obtain information about the stretch and principal directions of stretch, et cetera, and nice representations for some fundamental tensors. Um, now, what I'd like to show is make a few remarks and go ahead and first show eventually that the eigenvalues of V and U are shared and that there is a very simple relation between the eigenvectors of V and U. And that relation is governed through the rotation tensor R that appears in F polar decomposition. Okay? So let's make those remarks. Now, um, a few things. First of all, I'm going to say that one can argue, and uh, we're not going to argue in detail, but at this stage, you can believe me, and then you can do the thought exercise yourself. Um, the remark is, now remember, F is something that takes a line element from the reference and maps it to the current configuration, right? And this line element is going to for sure change its direction from reference to current, and also it's going to change its length. Now, when I explain it like this, right, it's going to change its direction, and then it's going to change its length. You might be tempted to think, for instance, right, operates on the line element, changes its direction, and changes its length. So R probably is responsible for the whole rotation, and V is responsible for the whole change in the length, okay? But that's not the case. It turns out R, of course, it's a orthogonal tensor. It is pure rotation. It cannot stretch anything. But V contains both stretch. It contains all the information about stretch, but it cannot help also rotate a little bit. And if you want to think a little bit more about that, that's natural because unless after rotation that line element happens to coincide with an eigenvector of V, it will not only stretch, but it will change its direction. Okay? So that's the basic reason why. Okay? So the comment here is that R is pure rotation, but U and V stretch and rotation. Okay. Um, that's pretty much the extent of the remark. Let me also note from this expression, I will take, for instance, R to the left-hand side and also express V alternatively as R U R transpose. So we understand that V is the rotation of U. And I'm going to uh, make use of that expression shortly as well. Yeah? By stretch and rotation, do you mean stretch and translation? Because that element might also translate. There's no translation. Here. Right. The, the translation information is not inherent in um, the tensor itself. The translation information, because we're talking about a point that is already in the motion map. The motion map takes the point from a referential position and sends it to the current position. What we're interested in is for a given point, there was a line element, and how much that line element as a vector has rotated and changed its length. We're not really attaching, we're not concerned with to, with, to which point that vector is attached. But if you want to know that, it's already in, remember, again, x is equal to chi t of capital X. So you know exactly where that point has moved. Okay. 
All right, so why don't you look here for a second. Now, um, I'm going to address those eigenvalue and eigenvector issues that I, that I mentioned. And let me work it out. There isn't a single way always of doing things in continuum mechanics as you've already figured out in the homework problems. Often there are multiple ways of solving a problem. I'm going to show that the eigenvalues of u and v are shared and that their eigenvectors are quantities that are related in a simple rotation through R. So B is equal to F, F transpose. So just don't write, and uh, let's do this together. And F is R, U, right? I've done this before. And this is R, U, switch, U, R transpose. So U is equal to, U squared is equal to C. Now that's equal to R, C, R transpose. So similar to U and V, uh, B is now the rotation of C, if you like. Now, therefore, if I write right, the spectral decomposition of C, right, so it's going to be, let me spread it out a little bit. So this is the spectral decomposition of C. R will operate from the left, R transpose from the right. And you've shown in the homework that I can move R inside here and R transpose as R inside there. And that's an expression that now I obtain. And now I know that the spectral decomposition of B is lambda square alpha, small v alpha, small v alpha. And hence I conclude that this must be v alpha, right? Or in other words, so the eigenvectors are related through this simple rotation expression. Now, now this also allows us to express R in a nice fashion. I've done this before. When I was discussing an arbitrary rotation tensor Q that related some arbitrary orthonormal basis E alpha to another one E prime alpha, from that expression I had shown that this relation such a relation immediately gives you the following expression for that rotation tensor, okay? So if you don't remember, just go back to your notes and you will remember. Now, therefore, R is a two-point tensor. It has to be that way. Why? Because U only lives in the reference configuration, but F is a two-point tensor, so that two-point information is within R. It's a right basis has to be in the reference because it's next to you, the left one on the spatial one. Um, so as soon as we have this, then there are a number of ways in which I can show um, that the eigenvalues of u and v are shared or that you have a simple expression for f. So let me first show a simple expression for f. So now this is r, and what I'm going to do is, for instance, from F equals RU, right? U is expressed as V alpha. R operates from the left. I move it inside onto capital V. R capital V is equal to small v. And therefore, F admits the simple representation lambda alpha, small v alpha, capital V alpha. Okay? So, um, that is also interesting because now, with respect to this strange mixed basis, it appears to be a diagonal tensor, but of course, F is not symmetric because the basis, it's a two-point basis, okay? So these are nice expressions that allow us to sort of, uh, at some point, and in certain instances, allow us to carry out some calculations or derivations um, compactly. So now, to the last point, that the eigenvalues are shared. So that's a very simple, actually, proof. This is the eigenvalue problem for u. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to throw in a r here on the left-hand side. I'm going to throw in an r on the right-hand side. Okay. So this is now small v alpha. And here I'm going to squeeze in an identity which I will express as R transpose R, okay? So then 
R V alpha, again it is small v alpha. R U R transpose, it's equal to V. So I have the eigenvalue problem for B, right? So if lambda alpha is an eigenvalue for U, it is also an eigenvalue for B. That's what I've shown. All right, so please complete that much. Okay, so now again, I'd like to highlight that hi highlight that that almost none of the expressions, results, and or concepts that I'm introducing uh, go wasted in the context in the structure of this particular continuum mechanics course we will need uh, them at one point or another. So the reason why I've introduced and analyzed the tensor C and B is because eventually they appear in the definition of so-called strain tensors. And strain, remember, is from undergraduate mechanics courses, is something that helps us determine how much the, how much deformation, how much length change occurs in some, let's say, structural element. Now, there are some desirable properties that you like to have uh, from strain tensors, and there isn't one, it's plural already, there are many, many strain tensors, uh, but there is something particular in common that you would like to, you would like these tensors to display. The first one is that if all the principal stretches go to one, okay. what does it mean for the principal stretches to go to one? What happens to you? Identity, right? U becomes identity. You have to just realize that F it's not necessarily identity, right? So then F becomes pure rotation of a line element. Now, I like this property, okay? Lambda should go to, uh, if it goes to one, strain should go to uh, zero. In other words, principal stretches, they indicate that the principal stretches, the stretches along the eigenvectors, there is there one, that means no stretch. So strain as a concept should tell me that, okay, strain is zero. That's conceptually the information that I'd like to have. Also, as a second thing, I'd like this strain tensor, whatever, however I define it, it should not be rotation sensitive. In other words, in this particular context, F is not necessarily identity. It would be pure rotation. But if F goes into the definition of a strain tensor, it should go in such a way that the outcome should be zero as a tensor. If something rotates, it does not stretch, and hence the strain conceptually as a tensor should deliver me or tell me that there is no strain. It has rotated, but that's not what you measure with a strain tensor, okay? The rotation tensor itself embodies all that information. The strain tensor exclusively concentrates on if the object I'm analyzing is deforming, okay? Not rotating, but deforming. Um, so, these are the two particular, pretty much the two particular major uh, properties that you like all strain tensors to express or display. Um, and let us derive two special ones. And for these, I will go back again to the expression for the map between line elements. So this is capital SM, small dsm. And I told you that strain is a concept that's related to the stretch, but in some sense indirectly, okay, as follows. I'm not going to look at the ratio between ds and d capital S directly. I'm, look at, I'm going to look at the change in the length of the squares. Okay? And that, if you like, of course, is related to lambda because this is lambda d capital S, so this expression is lambda squared minus one d capital S squared, okay? Uh, but I'd like to drive it 
or have an tensor which appears and which delivers me the value of this expression. So to do that, what I will do is I will recognize that d small s is the magnitude of d lowercase x and likewise magnitude of d capital X is d capital S squared. Um, and this here is, let's do that with a different color. So this is d capital X dot d capital X. So you can write, fill in the steps in between. I'm going to write over what I have already written. So what I'm going to do is, first of all, I'm going to throw in here an identity. Nothing changes. And then I know that this is capital F, D capital X, capital F, D capital X. And then I will take F to the right-hand side. It will become F transpose F. And now I have D capital X dot F transpose F, which is C minus identity. So this here is F transpose F minus identity, D capital X dotted with D capital X. Well, actually, let's already write C. OK. Um, and the tensor that lies in between C minus I for reasons that are not very clear at this stage, but let's say due to tradition at this stage, um, I will call it 2 times E. And now E is a new tensor. And E is called the Lagrangian or green strain tensor. It's clearly a quantity that lives in the reference configuration is one half C A B minus delta A B, E A bon, E capital B. The derivation? Yes. So this part's clear, right? No, this part's not. This transition? Yes. Yeah, okay. So. I've taken F to the right-hand side, so it's D capital S, F transpose F, D capital X, and that minus that. Right. 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 OK, so as, as we've done before when we were analyzing C and then we analyzed B, uh, I'm going to take the same concept and uh, express it in a slightly different way. So alternatively, what we can do is we can, of course, look at, again, D S squared, D capital S squared. That is what we're looking at. D capital S is 1 over lambda, right? d small s. Okay. Or okay. versus what we had before. So now again, it's the same expression. Again, it's in terms of lambda, but small d s is going to appear. Um, That's equal to, let me repeat the calculation, dx dot lower minus capital S dx squared. 
Um, and this is now f inverse d small x. f inverse d small x. And that can be written as dx identity minus this to the right hand side f minus transpose f inverse and the whole thing operates on again the lowercase x and this is what we're going to call two times this time small e okay <laughs> why do we have a different expression or a different notation because previously this tensor had to do with an operation on the referential line element. This time, what I see on both sides of the tensor is the spatial one. So what lies underneath or between those vectors should be something else. So that's 2e. And what you notice is that this is b inverse. Okay. Um, so we have e, again, the 2 out of convention, i minus b inverse. And because this is an object that lives entirely in the current configuration, it's called the Eulerian or Almanzi strain tensor. In terms of components, it's one half delta ij minus the components ij of B inverse. So this must be EIJ. Now you should note that in both expressions I have either b or c appearing. So b has to do with v squared, c has to do with u squared. So both of them, when the stretches go to 1, the principal stretches, they become identity. And therefore b and c become identity. Identity minus identity in both cases, it gives us 0. So these strain tensors, Eulerian and Lagrangian, so they give you 0 if there is no stretch. But remember, if there is no stretch, it doesn't mean that the deformation gradient itself is identity. It just means that it is pure rotation. So that's why we say that, or one says that, the uh, strain tensors are insensitive to rotation. And that's what we would like. We don't want to measure rotation through the strain tensor. Okay. And the reason why you don't want to do that is very simple. Because eventually, I will be interested in finding out the stress in objects. And I know that objects are not stressed if omitting inertia. So we're only talking about the material level behavior. If you take an object, OK, so again, no inertia, uh, and I just rotate it, I don't expect it to get stretched, uh, sorry, stressed, right? And therefore, if I want to relate stress to strain, OK, and if the strain was sensitive to rotation, then when I rotate the object, strain tensor, so-called tensor, would give me a non-zero strain. And then it would go to the, into the expression for stress, would spit out a non-zero value for stress, which, of course, is not physical. right? So the reason why we want to omit rotation sensitivity is because we want to characterize stress with strain. Right? That's the uh, practical reason. OK. Um, right. Now. We can easily relate the Eulerian and Lagrangian strain tensors. Okay? And uh, that expression, for instance, so it's not a rotation in this case. So one is not the rotation of the other, because what will appear is the deformation gradient tensor itself. But let me show you that that's, this is how it works out. So f transpose ef. So f transpose goes into that expression, f transpose f minus b inverse is f minus transpose f inverse. If you multiply it from the left with f transpose and f on the right with f, you get an identity out of that product. So that's identity. And this is nothing but c. And therefore, the outcome is the 
um, Lagrangian strain tensor. So that's just one nice expression um, that one may need once in a while. Now also, let me squeeze in here um, something else. And that something else has to do with the Lagrangian strain tensor. So the Lagrangian strain tensor E is equal to 1 half C minus identity. And C is U squared. So let me write it as U squared. Now it turns out that because there are only minimal requirements that you wish to see in the definition of a strain tensor, there are many, many strain tensors. We've already seen two. It turns out we can const construct any number of strain tensors. And one way to do that is to take that expression and generalize it. And I'm going to do that generalization by saying that instead of saying that this is the only possible Lagrangian strain tensor, I'm going to parameterize it with a variable m, and I'm putting it in parentheses so that we do not think of this as being e to the power m. So this is, m is an index that parameterizes e in the way, in the following way. So it's 1 over m, u to the power m minus identity, if m is not equal to 0. Right. So M could be, so with this parameterization, M could be 1. That's one strain tensor. Satisfies everything we'd like to see in a strain tensor. It could be 2, then you get the Lagrangian strain tensor. It could be 3, 4, 5, whatever you wish it to be. It can even be 0, but when it's a 0, there is U to the power 0 divided by 0. That's undefined, but it turns out as you let M go to 0, it doesn't even have to be, I guess, an integer, but it's, if you let M go to 0, there exists a limit, and the limit is logarithm of u. Now, how would you take the logarithm of u? Well, because u has a spectral decomposition, the logarithm of u is nothing but the logarithm of the eigenvalues, and you attach to it the standard eigenvector basis. And the reason I've sort of made that discussion, so one reason was to show that there isn't a single or only two strain tensors. There is a plethora of them. But another reason is in this special case when m is equal to 0, you get this particular expression where in the expression for E0, there appears the logarithm of the stretches. And let's look at what the logarithm of a stretch is. So ln lambda is, right, what was lambda? It was a certain change in the or distance on the, so you take a distance, a line, with a, with a length, the capital, delta capital S. On the reference configuration, it changes its length. It becomes delta lowercase s. And we've shown that this is exactly ln 1 plus epsilon, where epsilon is the engineering strain. And what is ln 1 plus epsilon? It's the true strain, OK? What we defined it to be the true strain. So now, uh, so it's funny how you express that, uh, right, the, that concept. It's the true as if the other one was false, right? But you remember in the undergraduate mechanics derivation, there is a reason why uh, you call that the true strain. It's a summation of in incremental length changes, and you always compare it to the updated length change. We had derived it in undergraduate mechanics. So in that sense, it's like the true strain. But here we see that it's just one of the many strains. But uh, it is a viable one. And indeed, it corresponds to the logarithm of u. And it is uh, the particular strain E0. Um, are these used? Yes. Um, there are. This is mostly a matter of choice. But um, in practice, uh, the most important concept that eventually goes into the expression for stress, remember, that's why we need strain tensors. In most of the cases, it is E 
or C or U. Okay, so the expression that has to do with the Lagrangian strain tensor. Sometimes you see logarithmic stretches, um, either physically in terms of theory or algorithm, uh, when you try to solve the problems where stresses related to such strain tensors appear, but most of, more often than not, it's the Lagrangian strain tensor that one makes use of. And there are reasons for that, some of which we will mention, some of which we will not have time for, okay, when we look at the special topics in the second half of the course. Questions? Okay, so we have actually completed the first part of, uh, let me say, after mathematical preliminaries, the first part of, the first subsection of um, continuum mechanics, and that was kinematics. So we looked at how things move, deform, and we've defined fundamental objects that govern that motion and deformation, like motion, like deformation gradient, like strain tensors, etc. So now that we have these concepts, we'd like to look at the emanating. So when the object moves and deforms, stresses will appear in the object. Now, of course, these things are happening because you probably are applying forces on the object. And so we want to analyze that, the action of forces on the motion of the object. And that's called kinetics. So that's what we are going to start with next time. And that's going to take a couple of lectures as well. Okay. All right. So I'll see you next time.